Hi there, I'm Trish Lynch from IOHR TV. Today we are in the absolutely stunning city of Oslo in Norway, where we brought our show NGO Focus. Today we're meeting with Secretary General of the Norwegian People's Aid, Henry Ette Kili Vestre. This organisation helps to improve the living conditions of people affected by war, as well as providing post-conflict reconstruction assistance. While Norway is considered one of the largest donors to international humanitarian assistance in Syria and its neighbouring countries, the Norwegian People's Aid believes instead in solidarity rather than charity. Let's now go to the studio to find out more. Henrietta, good to have you with us on NGO Focus. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell me about Norwegian People's Aid, because I know you have four main pillars. Tell me what they are. Yes, actually, uh, we are an organization who are founded by the Norwegian Labour Union. Uh, so we work for just uh, distribution uh, of power and resources. Mm -hmm. And we base all our work uh, in either uh, saving and protecting life and health or just distribution. So uh, that's, th that's the two pillars. Solidarity in action yeah. is your slogan. Tell me what that means. That means that uh, we will never work with charity. We'll always work with solidarity. We think that uh, every man should be able to fight their own struggles. So our job is to uh, help people organizing so that they can promote and protect their own rights. We should no, never go to a country and say that we could do something, but we should go to a country and say we could do something together with you. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, from people to people and together in between people. What would you say are the main issues that you're campaigning about in Norway at the moment? Well, uh, in Norway, um, as a, I should also say that we are a member-owned organization. So back home here in Norway, we have thousands of members who work voluntarily. We work with inclusion of refugees and we work with search and rescue. Uh, so that's the kind of the main Norwegian activity. Mm -hmm. But internationally, uh, which also are upon the political agenda, we are working a lot about inequality. Uh, we're thinking that it's a big challenge that uh, the development goals, uh, the, the goal when it comes to uh, less an, uh, inequality, Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, seldom uh, the politicians actually do something to reach that goal. They talk about it. Everyone says that, well, we have to fight inequality. But mm -hmm. then you, if you should make more justice, you have to redistribute resources. And that's hard. People often talk about who should get resources, but they seldom talk about where you should take them from. So I'll say fighting inequality. Uh, that's uh, one of the most important issues for MPA. You mentioned refugees and asylum-seeking children there. Tell me what you're doing to give them a dignified childhood. In Norway, uh, we used to run uh, centers for asylum seekers. Unfortunately, we do not do it anymore. And that's because uh, we lost the competition uh, against commercial actors who run much cheaper than what we could do. But out uh, in uh, Norwegian communities, our volunteers, they are welcoming uh, refugees who move to their community. So they help them with schoolwork. Uh, we learn them how to run a bike, how to swim, uh, mm -hmm. all these things that Norwegian kids are quite used to, yeah. but where, which is not natural if you come from a totally different place uh, from Course, Earth. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, what we mainly do. Uh, we, um, make people be part of the society and we try to invite them to also be members of our organizations. You're committed to promoting democracy in countries where it's weak. Where's the starting point? How do you do that? The starting point is to find good partner organizations mm -hmm. uh, because, as I said, we uh, want people to organize to promote, uh, pr uh, to protect their own rights and we want people to organize themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, uh, the, the, we always start with 
finding out what's the main challenge in this country and which organizations exist who can make a change. Mm -hmm. So in some uh, countries it could be organizations working for women's rights, in some organizations it could be farmers, uh, in other one where it could be people working with nat natural resources, and in other countries it could be those working in the informal economy. But we are looking for the strong organizations or the organizations with potentials. Those mm -hmm. we are thinking that if we go in working together with them, they can actually make a change in their society. So that's where we always start doing the partner assessments, finding who is the key persons and organizations mm -hmm. to make a change in this country. And then we are contacting them, uh, inviting them to cooperation uh, and finding out what do they need. Uh, in some countries, uh, organizations are weak and need almost all kind of help. In mm -hmm. other countries, they are quite strong and they just need uh, us supporting them, showing solidarity. So it differs from country to country. You also provide mine clearance activities in post-conflict zones. Yes. And there are many countries now, thanks to your organization, that are completely free of mines. But then we have recent conflicts like Syria and Iraq, which have contaminated everything all over again. What needs to be done now to try and clear those particular countries? Oh, in Iraq, in, in Syria, uh, it's, it's huge challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that we still uh, clean mines in Southeast Asia after the Vietnam War. So it takes decades from war ends until we have managed to remove all remnants of war. Uh, and that's why we also work on a policy level. Uh, we've been active in finding the mine ban treaty uh, and the cluster um, ban the, for the cluster ammunition, the ban for the cluster ban ammunition, because we can't just let every country put out mines and then the international society should finance to take them away. So make it illegal. That's important. But unfortunately, uh, we do now see more and more actors who doesn't respect international law, like ISIS. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's why we understand that there we can't work on a policy level. You just have to do the hard work on the ground. And it will cost huge amounts of money. And it will take, uh, even though how much resources we have, it will take many, many years mm -hmm. uh, to clear it up. And it's, it's terrible, the stories we hear about how the situation is in Iraq today, how mm -hmm. houses filled with uh, bombs. So when people come back to the home, they put on the electricity button, and then everything blows up. Uh, and they are in schools, in hospitals, they are in booby traps everywhere. Do you think that the international community is doing enough to help? Could they be doing more? Of course, the international community could always do more. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it, it's, it's much about uh, resources, of course, it costs a lot. Uh, but it's also uh, important to have as strong regulations as possible and as many countries as possible uh, condemning those who don't follow international law. And we still have strong international countries who are not part of the Mine Ban Treaty. Mm -hmm. So we need more and more uh, countries to be part of it and to be uh, follow the regulations and put more pressure on those countries who doesn't follow. So it's a combined yeah. policy and money. Tell me about the Conflict Preparedness and Protection Programme, which leads into what we've just been talking about. Tell me how that programme works. Conflict Preparedness uh, and Protection is uh, a programme where we are trying to teach people uh, how to act when you live in areas where uh, there are explosives. Uh, there's so many civilian lives that could be saved by very easy changing in the way they behave. Just learning that you should not stand in front of the window uh, when it comes explosions. Where should you put your bed? Uh, how to make a safe room? Uh, how to take care of the kids? And also we we'll learn the children uh, basic first aid. Uh, so we're making, uh, we are into schools, teaching kids. That's the best way also to teaching parents because mm -hmm. when the children are their skilled, they run home and teach the parents how to act. So what to do, uh, how to pack a grab bag, all these very, very 
uh, low scale skills that actually can save lives when a bomb explodes and uh, which unfortunately so many people doesn't know and um, being seriously hurt. So small measures and being prepared save lives. Precisely, that's what it's all about. So we are doing this in Gaza. Uh, Gaza have times after time after time uh, see bombs coming falling mm -hmm. down. Uh, and if the children know precisely what to do every one time they hear an, uh, the airplane or they hear the alarm, they you know we should move to there, we should not never go to the, the windows, we mm -hmm. should uh, we should also have something, some toys, so that we can think of something else. Because it's you should protect your body, but you should also protect your mind. So uh, also how to make children feel as safe as possible in these circumstances is important. What, what did the Israeli government think about you going in and interfering, as they might call it, in Gaza? We are not uh, one of the favorites. Uh, from the Israeli government, uh, unfortunately. And we share that challenge with, I think, almost all development organizations mm -hmm. working in Gaza. Uh, so um, we, have, we have been, uh, so uh, there's been so many times when they are spreading rumors about our activity. They're saying that we are supporting terrorists, mm -hmm. while what we are doing is teaching. Uh, youth and women how to be active how to work in politics but uh, and but that that's not mainly the the conflict preparedness and protection program that's not what pro provokes the mess what provokes them is the one we are working teaching people about democracy and the right to organize and we are supporting them against occupation then they're saying that uh, they're not happy with that no they're definitely not happy with that so that's uh, there also, the Israeli government has told the EU that EU should not fund NPA mm -hmm. because they say NPA support terrorism. But luckily, uh, EU, um, they just send us wishes with good luck for all our, the important job that we are doing. And they said that they would continue cooperation with us. So uh, that's good, but it's, it's hard. And uh, I think that's, uh, it's a really, really challenge. That's not quite a lot of organizations. They, don't take the risk working in Palestine anymore because mm -hmm. they can't stand up against the pressure they meet from the Israeli government. Henrietta, it sounds like you and your organization really have your work cut out for you. Thank you for coming today to share with us the incredible life-saving work that you're doing. We and appreciate uh, you. Thank you again for inviting me. Uh, with so many challenges we have to face together, so I'm glad I had the opportunity to talk about it. And thank you at home for watching another episode of NGO Focus. Please join us again and please do feel free to share this episode with as many people as you can on social media. Like us, share us, because raising awareness is what it's all about. Until next time, from myself, Trish Lynch, goodbye.